Did you know that Eustace Kid is a big, big Pokemon fan? Seriously, look at chapter 980 because the dude is wielding not just one, but two mighty Meltans. What a weeb. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. My name is Liam and my preferred type of coffee is a flat white. I mean, not usually one quite this large, but I accidentally ordered a large this morning, so I'm just gonna have to deal with it. And today we have some more mind blowing details to delve into regarding One Piece. You know that uh, the series I like to talk about on this channel and never anything else. Well, one of the reasons why I never talk about anything else is because of videos like this. There is just so much to unpack with One Piece that we cannot afford to let our attention waver, even for a second, because doing so would mean that we miss out on these glorious world-changing yet minor details. And to begin this exploration, we're going to have a round of Berry Bonanza, a very simple mini game where I give you a berry amount as well as three items. And it is going to be your job to guess which item you can buy for that amount within the One Piece world. And should you guess incorrectly, then your punishment will be to subscribe to the Grand Line Review, which will also result in consistent injections of One Piece culture administered straight into your YouTube feed. And if you are correct, then you will win the item in question, yay. Let's get to it though. Which of the following can you buy for 100,000 berries? Is it A, Arlong's hat, B, the Sandai Kitetsu, or C, exactly 700 cabbages? Which will it be? A, B, C, or, well, actually no, just those three. So please do make your choice now and we shall reveal the answer in three, two, one, and bam, it is A, Arlong's hat. The sound Kitetsu is valued at 1 million berries and 700 cabbages would cost you 105,000 berries, given their going rate of 105 berries each. So if you guess the sword or the cabbages, then you know the thing to do and please do say hi in the comments down below if you are a new member of the Grand Fleet, welcome. Oh, and just in case you are wondering, Yes, for reasons. We do canonically know how much Arlong's hat cost him because it was revealed in One Piece 10th Treasures, which FYI, 100,000 berries would be around 1,000 US dollars. So say what you want about Arlong, but he clearly stays on top of the world of high fashion, by which I mean, Crap fashion, don't buy this hat. Transitioning very smoothly now, one of the things I love most about One Piece is how rich the world is when it comes to business and economics. Two words, I was gonna do three there. Two words which I insist are much more fun than they sound. Most people read or watch One Piece for action, comedy, drama, adventure, stuff like that. But when you do take the time to look deeper, there is a very functional world at play here with its own powerhouse economic empires. A great known example would be Papug's clothing line, Criminal. In the series, we actually got to visit a criminal store and we've seen that logo on all sorts of clothing post time skip. However, a little known detail is Papug's major fashion rival brand is known as Dosukoi Panda. And if you look very carefully every now and then, you will find a character wearing clothing branded with a sort of hefty stomach hunched over panda. And this, dear viewers, is a sign of pure mmm quality. Doskoi Panda is a very, very high-end brand in the One Piece world, specializing in seemingly every product imaginable, clothing, homeware, even toys. It's a legitimate business empire operating behind the scenes that cater for the more wealthy of individuals in the series. For example, it's been said that a simple t-shirt can cost 10,000 berries, which is about $100 or so, so it's pretty restrictive. Although if you want to think about it in a more positive way, it's only one-tenth of an hour long hat, so there is that. But this comes with some great in-world consistency as well, because the people who have Doskoi Panda merchandise tend to have access to a bit of the old money. Like Nami, for example, who is more money than she is human, or Helmeppo, who can be seen wearing a Doskoi Panda beanie on the cover of chapter 84. Why does he have this? Well, it's because Helmeppo grew up as a lavishly rich douchebutt. But the funniest thing is this goes a layer deeper because there are also knockoff brands of Doskoi Panda within One Piece. My favorite of which is the one where it's just Doskoi spelt with the number one at the end. But there's also the off-brand Cyber Panda, offering more budget-friendly options. But it is thanks to the world of fashion that we have our next minor world-bending detail, which is that it would appear that Sabo was present at Luffy's execution, or I guess I should say attempted execution in Logtown. In chapter 98, there's a very retrospectively curious panel in which we see spectators gathering to watch whatever the weird clown man is doing to the poor rubber boy, and it seems to have caught the attention of a third man who pretty much exactly matches Sabo's design. And not only that, but this Sabo figure also pops out quite a bit because he's the only one in this shot who has a predominantly dark aesthetic, basically making him the center of visual attention. You can also spot this figure again in chapter 99 after he appears to have made his way to the front of the crowd where he continues to match Sabo's eventual aesthetic by wearing lighter colored pants. And all of this is very interesting because there's a whole ton of debate about you know, how planned Sabo was and this and the ace tattoo are the biggest pieces of evidence to say that he was very, very planned. And I should say that it has never been confirmed 
confirmed that this is Sabo, but it's a mighty huge coincidence because for a background piece of, I guess, glorified set dressing, this figure is pretty damn distinct. And it does make sense because this is far from a random location. You know, Dragon was also in Logtown at this exact time. So it's an entirely reasonable thought that Sabo just sort of tagged along. The thing that does get to me though, is that this would mean that Sabo saw Luffy. He saw Luffy about to be executed and that was not enough to reverse his narrative amnesia. Whereas the news of Ace's eventual death was. So it makes me wonder if Buggy had been successful here, would this have been Sabo's moment of reversal if this is indeed him, which I should stress, it may not be. It might also be a case of reverse engineering the situation. And what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of people will claim that Sabo was planned because of Ace's tattoo with the whole S being crossed out thing. Whereas I think it's equally as likely that Oda chose the name Sabo because he looked back on Ace, saw this random element he made and went, you know what? Starting his name with S would work out really, really well with this other thing that I have already established. A sort of happy narrative accident that happens when you're writing. And to stretch that further, that could be what happened with Logtown as well. Oda looked back on this bizarrely standout figure and went, aha, I can do something fun with this. Whatever the case ends up being, these are still some pretty wild panels in retrospect. Sticking with Logtown for a bit, one thing that does show Oda's potentially extreme foresight is watching Nami play dress ups. Because while shopping, she essentially ends up cosplaying as both Nico Robin in her alabaster gear, as well as this sort of budget version of what would eventually become a Boa Hancock. Now with this, I am far more inclined to believe that Oda was making a sneaky reference here because Robin would be introduced shortly after and Boa Hancock's character has been pretty much planned since like forever. In fact, we can even see one of her original designs from behind in One Piece Color Walk 2, a book that was released in 2003, about five years before Hancock was actually introduced in the series. So Oda had her in his back pocket for an awfully long time and this Nami reference may actually suggest that he was planning on introducing Hancock far earlier in the series, before you know all the, uh, the stuff happened, like the, the crocodiles, the sky gods, foxes, assassins, zombies, so much stuff. There really wasn't much room for a snake empress before all of that mess got dealt with. But it's not just future One Piece characters that Oda slots in here and there, because he's also been known to produce his own versions of famed manga characters from other series. And here we're going to talk specifically about Naruto. Yet yeah, Chira Oda and Masashi Kishimoto became quite good friends as well as rivals back in the day. And as a result, every now and then you will come across a Naruto reference in One Piece or vice versa. One of the funniest examples would be during Marineford, where Oda drew his own versions of Kisame and Jirai in chapter 577, although you can see their resemblance far more clearly in the anime adaptation. And good old secondhand Kisame and Jiraiya were members of the Whitebeard Pirates. In fact, the Kisame, whose actual name in One Piece is Namo, is actually a division commander, so hmm, good on him. Although to the best of my knowledge, the Jiraiya character remains unnamed, so I asked all of you to name him in my community section, and the first answer I got was Jempy. So let's all say hi to Jempy, I guess. But we're not done here, because on the cover of chapter 766, Oda actually drew Luffy eating ramen with the Naruto in question, in order to pay tribute to the series concluding. Although the figure of Nami is obscuring our ninjally inclined lad. And to top everything off in the final chapter of Naruto, Kishimoto also snuck in a One Piece tribute by having Boruto deface Hokage Rock with the Jolly Roger of the Straw Hat Pirates, which is pretty damn cool. Let's talk about long heads now. It's, it's an abrupt change, I know, but there's a whole ton of established races in One Piece with radically different beings like giants and fishmen and minks. And then there are some closer to basic humans like the long leg, long arm, and even the snake neck tribes. Weird, but still kind of human. However, within One Piece, it would appear that there may be an even rarer, potentially even weirder breed of human life, which can be seen in the long head people, of which we have three examples. For those of us currently in Wano, we have the most obvious being Fukurokuju. However, if we cast our minds back, which may or may not be a difficult exercise, depending on the size of your mind head, we will also recall the silhouette of Dr. Vegapunk shown to us during Punk Hazard, which appears to picture him with a massively vertically aubergine style head. And also within the Marines, we have Vice Admiral Strawberry and that thing he has has been confirmed to be a head, hence the need for a long hat to cover the long head. In fact, Oda has even been asked in an SBS who has the longer head, Strawberry or Fukurokuju? To which Oda answered the former and that apparently Strawberry's head grows every time that he becomes sad. Oh, which is almost certainly a joke, 
Or is it? Because at the same time, these long head guys are just, they're just so strange. Mainly because their heads do continue to grow. Strawberry's own head has grown exponentially during his time with the Marines, and Fukurokuju actually appears to have had something of a normal head 20 years ago. I mean, I say normal, but it's probably something more akin to uh, like a chode head. So there is definitely something interesting happening here, and most races in One Piece carry some sort of similar phenomena. A good example would be mermaids whose tails split once they reach the age of 30. So Perhaps this rare long head tribe have various conditions under which their heads grow. Perhaps even the one that was thought to be a joke with the whole strawberry becoming sad thing. Either way, one head, that is a quirky design choice. Two heads, well, it's a coincidental set of quirky design choices. Three long heads though, Ugh, that's a pattern. And there is definitely something more to be explored here in the future. Meanwhile, one of my favorite small details in One Piece has always been the existence of these amazing barrel shaped mugs. They're awesome and adorable and I need one in my life. If you know where I can get one, drop a link in the thing. I'll click it and hooray. But thematically, they work so well with the overall concept of goofy piracy. However, it is interesting to note that the barrel mugs were not always the standard of liquid receptacles in One Piece. If you go back far enough, let's say chapter one, because that's pretty far, you'll notice that everyone is actually drinking from a more standard glass. But shortly after, glasses were nowhere to be seen, and that's because Oda, or probably more accurately Shueisha, felt that this may cause a bit of the old trouble due to Japanese laws around alcohol, which states that you cannot drink unless you are 20 years or older. And many characters in One Piece, particularly the protagonists, are very much under 20. So in order to get away from this, Oda simply made a design choice geared at hiding what was actually in these mugs, keeping it nice and ambiguous. You know, they're probably just drinking fruit juice or something. Although I'm personally quite glad that this choice was made, because this is one of the few times where censorship has resulted in a pretty fantastic development. The barrel mugs just work so much better. They're detailed, thematically appropriate, and most importantly, they are merchandisable. I'd be shocked if Shueisha had not produced and sold One Piece mugs in the Mugiwara stores. And if they haven't, what are you doing? Get on it. Because I have a barrel mug fund ready to go. And if you wanna watch more One Piece stuff, and let's be honest, you do, then do check out this video exploring the top 10 most disturbing devil fruits in the series. Weird and somewhat terrifying stuff. So I look forward to seeing you there.